part of biomedical research and us, which is part of computing research. So the, the institute was uh, established with a goal to become a global leader um, in uh, certain areas of applied computer computing research. And the key word here is applied. We wanted to, to do something that would have an impact on the society and the, the, the residents and citizens of Qatar and the region. Um, the way we would do this is by uh, conducting innovative research in uh, you know, across multiple disciplines in this uh, applied uh, research. And so it had to go along with the priorities of the state of Qatar, of course, which is enhancing the uh, quality of life for the citizens and society, uh, enabling greater scientific discoveries. And that's been happening quite a lot here in, in, in Qatar. We were quite proud of the, the progress that's happened so far. And also enabling the local businesses to compete globally. You, know, you, you want to give them that edge so they can actually uh, step out of the, the boundaries of the country. The uh, institute was founded in uh, 2010. Uh, we're at about 125 employees right now. And um, the nice thing about the uh, institute is that it has a very big uh, mixture of scientists, postdocs, uh, program managers, software engineers. But the better thing is that we have a, a rich mixture between academia and industry. Now, if we're doing research just for research purpose, um, you know, it's good to have the academia. But if you want to go further out, if you want to uh, make products, commercialize, it's always great to have that industry perspective in there as well. And um, also a great perspective is the diversity that we have, over 25 different nationalities that really you know, blends it in together. <coughs> and then we have a very aggressive plan to triple the number by 2018. So we're uh, aggressively hiring and, and uh, looking for uh, the right talent. As mentioned, we're not doing research for the sake of research, right? So the areas of research we do are very carefully selected. There has to be a specific problem that needs to be addressed. And so uh, at this point, we have these six uh, different areas of research. The, the largest one is the Arabic language technologies. It just falls you know, correctly that we are in an Arabic-speaking country. Um, the Arabic language is lagging behind a lot in the computing sense. And so we really need to add this uh, energy into it. Uh, computational science and engineering, I'm not going to say much because I don't understand any of it. It's about genomes and things like that, so it's just way past my uh, day grade. <laughs> uh, Cybersecurity, that is very important. Uh, as you know, Qatar is actually a, it's got a big bullseye on it, you know, from quite a few uh, countries in the region and, and elsewhere. And so cybersecurity, there are a lot of attacks and threats that happen. And uh, cybersecurity was identified as one of the three big bets or challenges for Qatar. We have the uh, water, water threat, energy security, and cybersecurity. So we were tasked with leading this effort, uh, working with the Ministry of Interior and other stakeholders here. Uh, data analytics is also a very big uh, research area that we have, dealing with big data. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, distributed systems, cloud computing, video processing, so converting 2D to 3D video and, and projects like that. And finally, social computing innovations. That's a place where we've really put our mark uh, in the world. Um, we've got a lot of projects here uh, dealing with specifically with human uh, um, with disaster areas, recovery and crisis management. So I'll talk about that as well. And please, if you have any questions, just go ahead and interrupt. I think it's fine, we're gonna to have to wait till the end. And so we're, we're quite uh, proud of the achievements we've done so far. In the past three, three or four years now, uh, we've got quite a lot of citations, publishings, and um, um, we have filed over 71 patents in the US and and five of these have already been granted. And, and this across these six different areas of research. And uh, we've actually spun off one company, so this was uh, a, a nice uh, achievement. Um, it's called Data, Data Tamer. 
in the US. Uh, we've got several technologies that, I, I think we've, we've gone past it for, several technologies that are currently licensed and being used by uh, businesses, and quite a lot of different software that's been deployed. Um, not to toot our own horn, but uh, these, you know, we've had quite a bit of mention in the top media around the world. Uh, this is just some of them. So it's really nice to see um, the name of an institute that's local, that's here, being recognized uh, worldwide. So moving on, we'll talk about the Arabic language technology since this discussion about Arabic content. And I'm glad I went first, I was telling uh, Khaled, because content is really boring compared to robotics. So at least you don't have to compare me to what he uh, in the Arabic language technologies, uh, we, we've actually done quite a bit of work here. We've uh, developed software, we've um, uh, actually filed patents, and just to give an idea, <coughs> in the Arabic language technologies team, we work in two tracks in parallel. One is the technology, and the other is the content. So the technology is what's going to enable the creation of the or the consumption of the content. Uh, without that, really, you cannot do much in terms of the language. So, with regards to technology, the core of using a language uh, in, by computers is natural language processing. I mean, this is the foundation, the cornerstone. If the computer cannot process the language, it really cannot do much with it. And what you see here are all uh, technologies. These are not products, they're not solutions. Now, it's the, once we have these technologies, it's the, uh, uh, it's the job of the entrepreneurs to actually figure out what to do with this. How can you combine these technologies into a solution or a product? We've done some of that, but we are a research institute in the end, and so this is really not our end goal. With natural language processing, it's things like, how do you split up a word? How does the computer know this is a noun, a verb, an adjective? Um, an example of a technology that can become a, um, a product, if you want to do text-to-speech, so that the machine can actually pronounce the words. In Arabic, you have the diacritics or the short vowels. Without that, it's impos almost impossible for the computer to disambiguate the meaning of the word. What does that mean? So for example, alam, ulima, allama. It's the same word, but the vowels are different. So you really need to have these uh, diacritics. To have these diacritics, you need to know what the word is about, what the context. So we've built a diacritizer. You just put in the text, it will actually put these vowels for you. So this is a, a technology that can be used into a solution which is the speech to text, uh, text to speech, sorry. If you have information, you have to have a way of getting to it, right? So information retrieval. This is where we built our own search engine. When QCRI was first established, one of the goals was build the super search engine that would you know, put Google to shame and Bing. But that's not really a research program, you know, project. And uh, what was decided instead was to focus on a smaller, um, fo uh, have a smaller focus to work on the Arabic language. So we have an enterprise search engine that you can deploy in your company's uh, database, on your website, that will have uh, Arabic specific features. So when you search for a word, it actually breaks it down to the root, and then it expands your search results. Um, one example I always use is that when, uh, I haven't done that in a while, so I'm not sure what the results are, but previously if you search in, 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 in English for the Valley of the Kings, you will get all the information you need about the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, next to the pyramids. But if you search in Arabic, Wadi Mulub, you get zero, nothing, not a single hit that is correct. You get Wadi um, Ziyab in TV shows, basically. TV series, so nothing that has to do with what you're really looking for. And this is where it's important for the engine to understand what you're looking for and try to find out for you. Machine translation is also extremely important. Yes, sorry. Is that a problem of content availability or search? It's both. Well, if the content is not there, you're not going to get it. But if it is there, but not uh, tagged properly, or you're not searching for the exact words that you, you know, and the search engine needs to understand the context to try and find it for you in context. So for example, we have a, a, a video search right now 
that will find what you're looking for, uh, but not when you, for example, if you search for um, you know, Daesh, which is you know, ISIS, it will find for you ISIS, it will find the Islamic State, it will find ISIL, so anything that's related to it. Uh, similarly, if you search for a person's name, uh, you know, Mahmoud, Abba, Mahmoud Abbas, it will find Abu Mazen, you know, whatever relates to that. So it's both. The content has to be there, but it also has to be uh, searchable, that you can find it. Machine translation um, also uses a lot of the technology. You know, the diagrammatization is very important for that. If you have that, it will help with the, with the outcome of it. We built our own engine as well, this is the machine translation. Uh, we've entered it in a couple of context, uh, con competitions, and we've gotten first and second place. So it's, we're also pretty happy with the, uh, the results on that. Um, audio transcription is extremely important for many reasons. I'll talk about that in more detail. But this is the basically the speech to text. If you have a video or an audio, and you want to see like the closed captions on the screen, so we do that for Arabic. Optical character recognition, you know, you're scanning a document, you want to digitize it. Uh, there are a lot of softwares out there. Um, not, they don't all work very well, and there are specific challenges. So if you go back to the old manuscripts, the fonts were different, their handwriting. Uh, Letters were not always connected properly, so there are a lot of challenges. So we're doing some research on this. How can we improve that uh, uh, process? Uh, we do tweet analysis. This is really uh, fun. It's actually, we've been collecting every Arabic tweet for the last three years. It's about the tune of, I think, 10 million tweets a day. And, uh, and then we do our own analysis on it. You can understand, um, you can do the rudimentary sentiment analysis at this point. With Arabic, it's really difficult to try and figure out you know, if, they, if it's positive or negative. But we do that. We do a lot of, um, I'll, I'll show actually Tweet Mongas, which is one of our products right now. And um, we, there was just a recent uh, research done in our, by one of our team members um, about the propensity just from analyzing tweets, understanding if a person is pro-ISIS or anti-ISIS, or if they're going to be pro or anti. And this was done and actually picked up by quite a few uh, news organizations. Um, it was very interesting. It, it's, it's, you know, just from tweets, you can, from the hashtags used, you can get a very good um, idea of where somebody's ideology is going, not necessarily just ISIS. Yes, as the events happen, exactly. Uh, and this is the case with tweets that always has to be related to an event or an article or something that goes with. And then we have a lot of uh, work on educational applications, and again, I'll, I'll show those as well. So on the, on the content side, we've done quite a bit of work, um, a, a little bit focused though. So we've done work on Arabic Wikipedia. Uh, we're working right now on enriching the Arabic medical content. Uh, we have a social interaction platform. We haven't launched it yet, but it's ready. And we are working on an Arabic book reference. So again, I'll talk about those. So <clears throat> since we're talking about content, I mean, the first question is, do we have a problem with it? And, and it's, uh, you know, everyone's saying there's not enough content. So if you just put the word, Esmet al you know, the, the crisis of the Arabic content, the 902,000 hits. Obviously, this is a combination of these words, so it's not all about you know, the crisis. But if you search, you know, separately, the problem of Arabic content, lack of, lack of Arabic content, well, you get, you know, thousands of hits for each one. So at least people are talking about it. So you know, if it's not a problem, there's something happening. Um, as is you know, commonly known by a lot of, you know, this, the numbers being used is that the Arabic content makes up 
three, one to three percent of the entire content. And that is a very, very small number, given that Arabic is the fifth most spoken language in the world. And so, you know, looking at three percent, and three percent is probably on the higher end. Um, and to make matters worse, is that out of this three percent, seventy-five percent is what we would consider, you know, not valuable content. I mean, value, valuable is a relative term. For someone, you know, a movie is valuable, but if you look at the, the um, educational value, the research value, the scientific value, 75% is in the form of entertainment and forums. And to make it even worse than that, 80% is actually recycled and not original. So the original Arabic content that's valuable is minuscule. Yeah. <laughs> No, not necessarily. Uh, recycled as in the same content repeated over and over again. Oh, Arabic. Arabic. It's all Arabic, yeah. We don't differentiate from the source, whether it's original versus translated, uh, as, as, as long as it's Arabic. Um, so what's the reason? Is it lack of people that use the Arabic language? Not really. I mean, the figures here show you that Arabic uh, is the, the number of Arabic users on the internet are, are the fourth in the world. Uh, which still only makes up 4.8 percent of, of the internet users, but still, it's uh, you know, from a ranking perspective, it's, it's not bad. Um, but if you look at um, so, what what other reason is it possible that you know they don't have access to the internet? Actually, internet penetration, yes, it's lower than the world average, but not considerably lower. So, 36 percent of Arabic speakers uh, have access to the internet uh, versus you know 39 for the world average. So maybe they just don't care about Arabic language, that they, they don't want it. Uh, but if you, if from a survey that was done about you know, what language would you prefer the content in, 60% actually want it in Arabic, for the Arabic speakers. 33% um, in English, six in French. So it's there, they want it. And we were just talking that there is a problem, there are a lot of problems about the lack of the Arabic content, but basically that just transforms to uh, a lot of opportunities. People want it. They just want it in the right form and the right way. Exactly, uh, all of the Arabic speakers who use the internet. Uh, but now the survey, I, I honestly don't know what the sample is. It's from the Arab World Online. Uh, I think the previous slide doesn't know about These are the speakers, the number of speakers, yes. But yeah, uh, yeah, on the internet. But how many people were actually used in the sample? I honestly don't know. Yeah, it's a good question. I should, should know that. So what, what, what are the challenges here? I mean, why do people, uh, why is there this problem? So when, uh, when again, when surveyed in the same report as to why, uh, what the challenges against using the internet, um, you know, the, the first two, accessibility, connectivity, and cost, this is more of a global issue. I mean, it's something that is everywhere. Uh, but then the next one is lack of content in my language. So 41%. You know, uh, stated that the lack of language, uh, content in their language prohibits them from using the, the internet. Um, now, we're also talking about this with Sarah. What, when I was back at Microsoft, I was in charge of language planning, deciding which languages do we uh, localize Windows and Office into. So when I left, we were doing 115 languages. But deciding which language, the, the number one uh, priority was for monolingual users. Basically, if you know this country, majority don't speak English or French or you know, one of the major languages, then you really have to provide them with uh, the software in their own language. Otherwise, they cannot use it. If it's a preferential thing, it's a lower priority. So in this case, there are a lot of Arab countries where you have monolingual users, whether it's in Saudi, in Kuwait, in Egypt, and they really require that in their own language. So, but, but also it's not that bad. I mean, it's, it's not all dark and gloomy. 
if we look at Wikipedia as a uh, indication of where things are going, uh, you know, in, in uh, 2012, there were uh, 318,000 articles, okay? Today, uh, it's almost doubled at 625,000. So that's a pretty good increase over three years. It's, it's, uh, it's acceptable. Um, so at least we're moving in the right direction. But at the same time, when you look at the ranking of Arabic on Wikipedia, Arabic is ranked uh, 16, right? So yes, it comes after Chinese, Portuguese, and Japanese. That makes sense. But then when you look at languages like Cebuano and Wariware, Wariware is the fifth language uh, in, spoken in, in the Philippines. So it's not even a primary language, right? So for that language, uh, they have doubled the Arabic uh, articles. In uh, Dutch, 20 million speakers, they have almost 2 million uh, articles. We have uh, 600,000. So there's a lot of work needed. And when you dig deeper, you'll see that the reason is the, the number of editors is considerably smaller for Arabic. Uh, the creation of articles is smaller. We have a lot of translations happening, but uh, we need to put a lot more effort into this. Yes and no, because um, even for the other languages, I mean, there's really not, when, if we're talking about Wikipedia, the, the mo most, you know, the biggest incentive for Wikipedia is self gratification You put up an article and that's there for you. Um, so for, you know, in this case, I don't think incentive is, but in general, yes, incentive is a big problem. You, you have to incent them to create or to do something. So what we did here at uh, QCRI is we, uh, we have this initiative called IFRA. IFRA means enrich in Arabic. So we want to enrich the Arabic content. Uh, so this is more like an umbrella that includes all of the different projects. So specifically, we we have, uh, you know, with Wikipedia, the first thing we did was did professional translation of 10,000 articles. This was more like, okay, let's get something going. Let's move people, just, you know, uh, excite them to do some work. Then we used, uh, working with the Arabic Wikipedia community, we used Bot to create 100,000 uh, articles um, in the geography domain. And Ebot is a software that actually takes the English article, translates it into Arabic, but very, you know, it's a seed article, so it's very small, just takes the, the important information, puts it there for others to go in and add to the, the article. So whereas it took us about a year to do 10,000, no, it took us about actually almost two years to do 10,000 articles, professionally translated, very expensive. It took a fraction of the cost and about six months to do the 100,000 articles. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, bot. The bot, which is the, uh, the software that it's, it's a, uh, a software that just picks up the, the information and puts it in. No, no. Uh, the Arabic uh, Wikipedia community. So they, they, there is a lot of these bots. And uh, at first we were reluctant because we don't want to just add articles, you know, for the sake of saying the number went up. But when we compare it with other languages, actually Dutch that has two million, I think 90% of the articles were bot created and not man, you know, human uh, created. Yeah. So there's a lot of this. So at least you know we put 100,000 articles about cities, uh, geographical locations. If somebody doesn't speak English, they go put a name of a village in the US somewhere. At least now they know where it is and, and you know how many in the population and, and so on. Yes. And uh, finally, we also created an online uh, platform for translating articles from English to Arabic. If you go into Wikipedia and try to translate an article, it is extremely cumbersome. You have all of these formatting tags to take care of. If you miss one up, you know, something goes wrong. What we do here is you just log in, you type the name of the article you want to translate, it automatically extracts all of the text that needs to be translated, puts it for you in a nice editable editing environment. You can even uh, do a Google Translate as an initial step, and then you have to post edit it and make sure that it is correct. And then you just push uh, publish, it's out on your account. So it makes it so much easier than actually um, having to do it on the Wikipedia site. For free? For free. If you want to pay me, that's fine. We can talk about that. <laughs> For the health content, this is, I mean, if, if in general, 
content is bad for Arabic, health content is, is really, really, really bad. Uh, we've just started getting some websites that have some credible content, but before, if you ask any medical question, it's more about forums, my grandma does this, my aunt does that, so it's really hard to get any uh, credible information. So we went to Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic is you know, an authority on this. Uh, we partnered with the Qatar National Library. We licensed their entire medical library, and uh, we are now translating it into Arabic. It's currently being translated. And it will be made available through Qatar National Library. So at this point, it will be made available to the residents of Qatar, since each resident has access to it. Uh, so our license is for Qatar only. But this is, this is another place where I talk about opportunities. So now that we have this Arabic content, you know, our door is being knocked every day by ministries, by hospitals from all over the region who want this Arabic content. So now we will start licensing it out to them. So this way we can recover the cost of the translation. But it all ties in together very well because by doing the translation, we have the translation memory. We can improve our machine translation engine. We can, you know, it's, it's all part of the research as well. We're working on the uh, Arabic book reference project, which is, it's somewhat on hold right now, but basically we're going to the web to get uh, bibliography information about all Arabic books that have been published, the, the book name, the cover uh, image, the author, and all of that. And we want to make that available so that you, you can find, you know, any book you want to know about, you can find the information. And then the next step would be, if it's available in digital format, you can click and actually see it. Obviously, this is for the public domain uh, books, but then you know we can do something for the the uh, copyright books as well. The interactive social platform. I'm not going to do the demo. I'm just going. I took some screenshots just to show it. Basically, I wanted to find a, a venue for people who are interested in Arabic content to talk about it. So it's more like a Facebook, but for you know Arabic content, uh, uh, people interested in Arabic content. You log in, you have the carousel, the profiles of the different people, you can customize it as you want. Um, you have your timeline, your profile, you can uh, uh, post stuff and people will like it, they can share it. Uh, we have a reward system, uh, a chat functionality. So it's an entire uh, social interactive platform that you can uh, work on. And we hope to launch it fairly soon. The next step would be for that, to close the loop. At this point, uh, it is integrated in the sense that you can opt in when you first log in to say, whatever I say here gets posted on my Facebook or my Twitter account. Yes, in that sense it is. Um, we haven't launched it yet because, okay, we built it, but we don't really have a team to run it. <laughs> right? This requires an entire infrastructure. So uh, we're working with the um, the World Organization for the Renaissance of the Arabic Language, uh, which is a, uh, a new uh, center at QS. And they're responsible for enriching the Arabic content as well, so we work very closely with them. <coughs> this would fall very nicely into their lap. And this is what we talk about, you know, creating technology that enables content. So for, uh, when, if we switch over to technologies, um, you know, the, a lot of the challenges currently with the modern Arabic language is, you know, these things here. So dialects, um, you know, this first sentence was taken from the web. I wouldn't, the only word in here that is actually Arabic is the name Muhammad. Right? So Muhammad Darbat of Mubil Datu Direct Hospital. Muhammad was hit by an automobile and was sent straight to hospital. Uh, and, and so, you know, the uh, foreign, you know, important <coughs> foreign words like uh, I think uh, North African, Moroccan, or um, decoration. We have, you know, decorating the, the text using uh, characters that are not even Arabic. So here we have Persian, Urdu. Uh, elongation, where you, you, know, you want to put emphasis, so you put a lot of letters, you know, the same letter you repeated. Uh, or coining new terms. In this case, uh, such, such means uh, you know, truth. And so that's not uh, an existing word. Uh, Arabic, which is the uh, Arabic written in uh, Latin characters. So while we we don't want to encourage people to do this, right? But it happens. I mean, you know, this is what people do on the social uh, media and all that. And there's a lot of good content there that we don't want to lose. 
So this is part of what our natural language processing does. It actually normalizes that text. So it looks at the decorated text, removes all of that, converts it to proper uh, Arabic characters. Then it goes a step next, which is converting the dialect into modern standard Arabic. So we're doing a lot of work in that area, similarly for the RBC. It's, it's a very tough job, but it's, uh, it's very rewarding <laughs> to see that happen. So I, I'm, I don't want to take too much time, but uh, with the natural language processing, there's a lot that needs to be done. This is our entire stack, the things that we work on to get us into uh, the solutions that we want to have. Uh, but I want to talk about the, this product specifically because it's very important. The uh, QCRI Advanced Transcription System, CATS. This is the um, speech to text. So everybody knows what closed captions are, right? On the TV, you get the subtitles. That exists for you know from many providers for English, but for Arabic, very few actually companies do that, and the quality is not always at its best. Uh, in our case, we we have our own state-of-the-art system that provides uh, a guarantee of 85% accuracy, and it's currently used by Al Jazeera. So if you go to their website, you look at their videos hit on the closed caption, you will get those. And that's using our system. And on average, the quality is about 90%. It's only a 10% word error rate. Um, it's great because it makes the content searchable. Like if I, I know I watched a video and there was a specific part that I want, if I, the, the best case is if I know the name of the video, I can find the video and then I have to sit for an hour until I find what I'm looking for. If I don't know the name of the video, pretty much you're out of luck. In this case, when it's been transcribed, you just search for the word. It takes you to the video, you click on the word, it takes you exactly to the uh, location of the uh, And our next version allows for context search. So basically, you don't have to search for the exact word. You just put the idea that you're looking for and it'll find for you that segment. Um, and now we have actually dialect recognition. We recognize the top five dialects, so it will tell you right away if it's Egyptian, Levantine, uh, Moroccan, Iraqi, or Gulf. Oh, sorry, Egyptian or Gulf. Uh, unfortunately, this one is an offline solution, which means it's not for instantaneous um, uh, transcription. However, we we are working on it. We are at our prototype right now. So hopefully, within the year, we will have the instantaneous one. And this is a, a, an example of how you can uh, productize a technology. So I'm next week going to meet with CNN, Sky News, and uh, um, NBC to, to market this, to say, you know, this, because this saves them a lot of money and a lot of time. Uh, Al Jazeera, they, they used to do this completely manually for, for the shows that they wanted. Um, yes. Uh, I'm just thinking, suppose we have an English video running. Uh, can we have, uh, you know, some, uh, Transliteration uh, thing, which you know the guy is speaking in English, and you have the subtitles coming in Arabic for whatever he's speaking. Absolutely. Like, thanks for bringing that up because we do we do provide that already. So if the guy is speaking uh, Arabic, you have the option. Arabic. He's speaking yeah. some other language, but we exactly. So the one we implemented is he's speaking Arabic. You can switch to English, so the text comes out English. Yes. But it's easily uh, done yeah, the other way around. The reason we didn't do the other way is. Since this is an Arabic language technology, we only uh, develop the technology for Arabic speech recognition. To do the English is a different language model that we weren't interested in because it already exists. You know, you can, we can acquire it from somewhere else. Uh, but yeah, that's definitely um, something. So we, we actually were part of the BBC News Hack. It's a competition back in December. Um, and we were invited to it very late. So we didn't really know. The team just went there. And in two days, we won actually best, uh, best in show. Um, basically taking a, uh, an Arabic uh, BBC page, uh, translating everything into English, taking the Arabic video, uh, transcribing it into Arabic, translating it into English, and then uh, synthesizing the voice into English. So now we went from a completely Arabic page to a completely English page. And that was a, a, an amazing achievement in two days, and so uh, it was, was actually pretty good. So we have a lot of educational apps. Arabia app was built by interns uh, during our summer program. Uh, it's just you know teaching uh, Arabic for non-native speakers, very basic though. Madab al-Haruf 
was uh, an actual wheel that was uh, developed by Qatar Foundation International where you get the uh, Arabic letter and then the corresponding uh, English letter just so you can read your name, you know, this. So we took that and we actually developed it into an app, again, by one of our interns. The last one, though, Jalis, is um, there are not that many e-book readers in Arabic. So, you know, Kindle, for example, doesn't support Arabic. Uh, iBook supports Arabic, but not fully, not natively. So if you open an Arabic book, it goes left to right. So we, we built one on the iOS, but then the Supreme Education Council, they launched their e-bag initiative, which is replacing the uh, traditional textbooks with a tablet running on Windows. So we actually built uh, the Windows app for them. Uh, there were five companies uh, bidding for it. We, we managed to meet all the requirements, so we got this. Um, it does EPUB 3 and PDF, interactive content and multimedia, so it's really embedded within the videos and all of that. Uh, works on iOS and Windows 8, and um, it's right now being used by 40,000 students in, this, in the independent schools. So yeah. So this, that's what, what I mean by native support. Our uh, reader actually supports Arabic natively, so it understands all of that. In fact, we also have a patent for uh, language detection. If the book does not have the metadata telling, telling the reader this is an Arabic book, so it opens it from right to left, it actually goes in, if it doesn't find the, uh, the language ID, it goes in, grabs text, compares it to the code page, if it's Arabic, it makes it right to left. So it handles everything from, you know, perfectly. Uh, and in fact, I have it here. I can show it. Um, so it's, it's currently in use here in Qatar. And um, again, we are a research institute. So now we're depending on entrepreneurs to take this and see what can they do with it. Can they market it into a bigger solution, like a part integrated into a learning management system that is used by schools? So right now, we are in discussion to have it used in seven different Arab countries. Uh, Kuwait, Egypt, Jordan, Saudi, UAE. Uh, Tweet Mogas, this is a bit, it's a very nice app. This is what I was talking about, uh, analyzing the tweets. So um, we did the engine and all of this, but then we licensed it to a company in Egypt called Better IT that created this interface and the customer facing uh, approach. So basically, uh, you know, you have all of the tweets coming up here, you have a word map, and then you can select, like I want politics, Syria, and it brings up all of the tweets that deal with this. And, and the word Syria doesn't have to be mentioned, it actually gets it from the, the context. You can filter for text tweets, you can filter for image, for videos, and all this. So it's, it's really a, a great uh, uh, application. Now, this was used by Al Jazeera when, during the uh, Obama-Romney debate. When they had that debate, on the bottom of their site, uh, this, uh, all the data given was using tweet mobile, based on the tweets, basically. It just understands what, you know, how many times this was mentioned, positive, negative, and so on. We have a project called the Meeting Translator. Again, that's, you know, if you're in a meeting, people don't speak the same language, you should be able to uh, understand the other person, so whether it's lectures, presentations, so it's basically an interpretation. And we have a prototype already, so then we're just um, improving on it. Very quickly, other projects outside of the Arabic language technologies. Nadif is the data, data analytics. Nadif means clean, because it cleans up the big data. Um, so here we have a seven year joint project with MIT, the Computer Science Artificial Intelligence Lab working on them, uh, working on this. And we also have a two year contract with Boeing. Boeing gets a huge amount of data from the airplanes. The airplanes are you know, continuously streaming data about the performance of their specific parts. What we do is we, we, you know, we curate all of this data, clean it up, find out what the trends are. So one of the things is predicting the, when a specific part is going to fail. And that's been very accurate so far. And so Boeing is using it for two years now and then we'll see what uh, ADER, Artificial Intelligence for Disaster Response. This was actually used in a lot of the uh, disasters, whether it's the cyclone in Vanuatu, in uh, the uh, typhoon in uh, 
the Philippines, the uh, earthquake in Haiti. It, it's an application that links people who need something to those who can provide it and to allow to, to uh, the next one, Micromappers, uses that information to put on a map where there is damage, where there is uh, need for food, need for shelter, or somebody has something they can offer, and that's used to link people together. Uh, FAST is currently used by, FAST and EARS, both are used by Al Jazeera. Uh, FAST uses tweets about a specific article to predict the life cycle of that article. So we'd say, okay, this article is going to get 4,000 views. It has now received 2,000 views, so it's, it's halfway through. And Al Jazeera would decide, you know what, this is an important topic for me, I really need it, so they'll put more promotion and add it, or take it down if they don't want it. And that's been, our accuracy rate has been extremely high, in the high 90% in terms of what we predicted. Uh, ears is when, when an author writes an article, they have always the related articles link in the bottom. The articles that get related are only articles that the author knows about, or that they've actually authored. Uh, so it's really very restrictive. What this does is it actually recommends articles to the author. So when he, you know, the author says, okay, give me recommendations, just from the context, it'll put like a list of articles and then the author can choose those. Verily, when you have a disaster, you have a flood of uh, images that come out. A lot of it is fake. You know, like you have this big shark coming up to eat the diver coming out of a helicopter. So all of these things that come out, Verily is a crowdsourced platform that allows people to say this is false or, or, or uh, genuine. And then the last two are the video. And this is amazing. So, you know, 3D videos haven't really caught on much except in the movie theaters. And it's a chicken and egg problem. You know, the, the making them is expensive. Uh, and so manufacturers are not making devices that are cheaper. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's never ending. So what we did here is we actually convert 2D videos into 3D. So you don't have to spend the money when you create a 3D video. And when we did a sample uh, test, the, uh, the results were that people actually preferred the converted one to the original one. They you know, said it was more comfortable, it felt more real for them, and it's at a fraction of the cost of creating the 3D. And then finally is the 3D video streaming, you know, how we can get now 3D videos on your uh, smartphone and I think that's... So, so these projects are uh, developed by you or developed by you? Pretty much everything uh, is uh, developed in-house, yes. By our... Uh, well, um, <laughs> see, okay, that's where entrepreneurs come in, right? <laughs> so we are a, uh, a research institute. When we did CATS, the transcription system, and we offered it to Al Jazeera, they were partners with us, uh, we actually did not even have a mechanism to get paid. You know, we pay, we never get paid. So we had to set that up to see, okay. So now that we did this, okay, you know, uh, Al Jazeera, well, they're partners with us, which is fine, but if we go like now to CNN and say, do you want to use it? The first question is support. Do you offer 24 seven? Well, we offer support from nine to five if Majd Ahmed and uh, Imam Abdurrahman are available. <laughs> so, that's why now we're looking at the possibility of uh, spinning off companies, right? So let's spin off a company for uh, cats because, you know, CNN may come back and say, I love this idea, but I need you to do this and this and that. Okay, so this means we need to hire one more person. QF has a hiring freeze. Okay, if it's not a hiring freeze, then you have to go through a committee to find someone and, you know, with the, all the bureaucracy, it'll take forever. But if you actually create a company, then that not gets much simpler. You have the freedom to do what you want and to work. No, it's not. Actually, the, the initial uh, approach is that everything will go open source. But now we're kind of, you know, reevaluating. If we're going, you know, uh, commercializing, then this will be different. So, for example, the reader, the ebook reader, it's licensed to the Supreme Communication Council. Uh, we are going to release it at the uh, Windows Store for free. Uh, we'll do a little bit differentiation, you know, maybe put some uh, restriction. Uh, but because we want to still license it now to the Ministry of Education in the UAE in Egypt, and if 